I'm being told that uh, it's time to start. Uh, so, welcome everyone. My name is Thomas. I'm a developer uh, from Stockholm, Sweden, and I'm here today to talk about something I call a testable architecture. Um, and the subtitle is And Understanding What to Implement. So, let's start with who am I? What do I do? A lot of stuff. I deliver software, I write software, I do some mentoring, I do some teaching, and I do too much DevOps. So that's build automation, test automation, test driven development, clean and maintainable code, yeah, mentoring, and too much Docker and Kubernetes lately. It's interesting, but it's also very frustrating. Um, my definition of done is working software in production. Some people are happy when the unit test passes. I'm not. Some people are happy when the documentation is written. Is written. I'm not. It should be used by real users. Until then, it's not done. And you can have even, even harder definitions, such as it should be uh, decommissioned. Then you're done. Until then, you're not done with the software. Uh, I don't really share that view but I had a really interesting discussion with a bass player just a few days ago about that. I also play the trombone, uh, so it happens that I am uh, on stage playing. I'm going to do that on Saturday with an orchestra from Stockholm, uh, f celebrating their 60th anniversary. Ah, never mind. Um, what is a testable architecture? Well, I think that it's something that supports two things. We need to create confidence that whatever we're building actually works. And it should offer short feedback loops. If the feedback loop is long, I'm not really interested. So the keywords here is confidence, short feedback. That's what we're really looking for. And how can we create that? Mm, we'll see, we'll see. But as an industry, I think we have a big problem because we have a communication gap. We can't hear, or we don't understand each other, and sometimes we don't hear each other. And I'm afraid that sometimes people don't even want to hear what the other people are saying, but let's not go into that. But we have a problem understanding. So the goal for us should be to understand what to build and then implement it with confidence. If we can't understand what problem we should solve, it's not much idea to start implementing something, because it will probably not be correct. Uh, a tool that I use for this is something called behavior-driven development. How many in here say, think that you're using behavior-driven development? Okay, that was, wasn't too many. Uh, anyone using Cucumber? About the same persons. Okay. So the rest of you, you will learn something new. That's good. Uh, Behavior-driven development consists of four things. The most important thing is conversations. Then, concrete examples. Finally, there might be some automated acceptance tests, and at the end, we might write some code. But behavior-driven development is about these four things. Uh, and a way to discover things is to use, for example, the Discover Workshop, sometimes referred to the Three Amigos. You gather people from different disciplines, such as development, such as test, such as UX design, uh, product owners, yeah. The people who knows what we should build and the people who knows how to build it. And it's really important that you don't do this on your own as a developer, for example, because Bringing other people will give you different perspectives. So who here thinks that this is a nine? I think so. But now I think it's a six. So it all, all depends on your perspective. And that's why we want to bring in all people available. Um, suppose that we ju are just able to bring in developer and tester and business analyst. There are things that uh, me, as a developer, I know, 
There are things that a tester knows. There are things that a business analyst knows. There are things that I don't know. And I have learned that the hard way. There are things that a business analyst doesn't know either. We could draw this in a chart, like this. And we could realize that up in the upper left corner, we could put in the things we all know, well-known things. In the upper right corner, we could put in stuff that I know or a tester know, but the business analyst doesn't know. And the same goes for the lower right quadrant. Stuff that I don't know, but stuff that uh, uh, business analyst knows. And finally, we have the uh, danger zone, the unknown unknown. The area where we don't even know that we don't know things. These things uh, we can learn from each other. I can teach the business analyst something. The business analyst can teach me something. So that's a good thing that could happen during a discovery workshop. So the upper left, no problem here. Upper right, perhaps a little bit more complicated. Lower left, um, there are risks here. And the danger zone. So if we only get the traditional specifications, we will only get what the business analyst knows. So that's why we really want to do a proper uh, work discovery workshop. One way of doing that is something called example mapping. Anyone try that? Anyone heard of it? Great, so that's news for you. Example mapping is a real simple technique. You use pen and paper and you write Small examples for, say, one user story. Maybe you have rules regarding this user story. Write them down. Maybe you find questions. The goal is to get something like this. And if you're interested, you can read more about it at the blog post that Matt Wynn wrote a while back. There's a reference here. It's very small. But uh, if you search for example mapping, you will probably find something or ask me afterwards. So what should we expect from such a uh, session then? Such a session? Well, we're looking for concrete examples because that's the way people tend to understand things. Some people are good at uh, understanding abstract things, but most of us, we're really rubbish at that. We can't understand something that is abstract. We want concrete things. So we're looking for that. Here's one concrete example. The one where Marlin can remember about saving a note about booking Eric Eriksson Hallen. You have no idea about a few things here. You have no idea who Marlin is. That's my, my partner and girlfriend. Uh, remember about saving a note about booking. Okay, so she wants to remember something and she wants to book a venue for this concert I was talking about, Eric Eriksson Hallen in Stockholm. This is rather easy to discuss. Should, you, should she or shouldn't she do this? She says that she should, so I think that's a valid example. Let's do that. Um, such an example, if we can uh, make sure that we actually use them and implement them and execute them, they can act as living documentation. It could look like this. We have a scenario given something. When we do something, we should expect an outcome. I would not expect uh, examples like this from an example mapping session, but the examples you come up with from there is possible, should be possible to transform or formulate into this. Anyone recognizing this format? Some, not too many. It's called Gherkin. Uh, doesn't matter what the name is, but it's a format, and it can be used to run uh, some code. So I could implement this as a unit test like this. But the interesting thing here, or an interesting question I have here is, can you have a meaningful discussion about this in your entire team? If you show someone this, if you show your product owner this, could they uh, criticize it? Yeah, they could probably criticize it because it's unreadable for them. There's a lot of strange things here. There's semicolons. There's uh, something called string. What's a string? I don't know. There's a lot of code here, and your product owner probably can't read it. 
it's possible that your tester can't read it either. So if this is the only way we document what we should build, we are excluding a lot of people. That's a bad thing. Because we're in this together, we want to achieve something together, so we want something that everyone can read and criticize or uh, improve. So that leads me to, uh, again, behavior-driven development. Conversations, concrete examples, automated acceptance code, uh, acceptance tests, and finally code. So that's easy, and uh, that's the most valuable part. This is the easier part. This is a tech conference, so we'll focus on this, on the easier part. But remember that it's the conversation that matters, not the tools. But as I said, this is a tech conference. I guess most of you are developers. I didn't ask that. I should have done that. How many of you would say that you're a developer? Okay. Uh, how many of you are not a developer? One, two, three. Okay. So you're developers, most of you. Uh, so you're probably most interested in code. Um, and to be honest, that's easy. That's really easy. Just convincing your stupid computer to do something, that's easy. Uh, convincing people to do something or understand what they mean, that's complicated. Um, let's not dig more there. Um, test automation. This, I talked, said, uh, this, the topic here is a testable architecture. So I'm looking for something that we can automate. Um, test automation needs three, have, uh, I want three different properties from my test automation suite. I want confidence that the stuff works whatever it is. Um, I'm in impatient. I don't want to wait too long, so I want high speed, or if you want, short feedback loop. And when I talk about high speed, it's not okay if the build takes, I don't know, forever, 30 seconds. I lost track then. I don't remember what I did, if I have to wait that long. If I can keep it below a second, I would be really happy. Um, I'm working most with Java, so one second is, is possible, not necessarily easy. I also want low cost for my, uh, my uh, tests. They can't be too expensive to maintain, they can't be too expensive to, uh, to run. So the question is, can... Uh, no, rather. It's probably impossible to have the cake and eat it, so... We can't have the cake and eat it. And I checked it. That it's, uh, it's a saying in Swedish. I checked. Can you translate that? And you can. So that is a saying in English as well. Um, so confidence, speed, low cost. We could probably have confidence. But if we do that, we might not get speed. We might not get low cost. And the other way around, if we skip confidence, we could probably get high speed and low cost. And it's all a matter of where do we connect to the system under test and how do we connect to it that will give us these different properties. Uh, so is this possible to uh, balance? Is it possible to get the best out of both worlds? Yes, it is. And it's not even complicated. At least I don't think so. Uh, anyone recognizing this uh, pyramid? Yeah, it has different names. Not too many of you, but it has different names. Some people call it the Agile Testing Pyramid. Some people call it the Testing Pyramid. Uh, what we're trying to show here, or I'm trying to show here, is that uh, if we connect to a system through the user interface, it's usually slow. And it's definitely expensive. If we connect to a system on the test somewhere else, say in the middle, at some kind of service layer or whatever you want to call it, it's faster, it's less expensive. But if you really want to do something really fast, you want to connect at unit level. You want unit tests or similar. That's fast. That's also rather cheap. And it has another good property. If we test something really small, we have a really good diagnosis precision. When stuff breaks, we understand why. Because we test a really small thing, there's probably just one reason why it fails. If I connect to something from the user interface, for example, uh, there could be multiple reasons why something is broken. So I have to start troubleshooting. And that's expensive. That's annoying. 
So we would like to have good diagnosis precision and we would like to have confidence, we would like to have speed and we would ha like to have it not to be too expensive. Okay, lots of requirements. Um, one way of showing this is with a concrete example. And this is in uh, Swedish, so you probably can't read it. I asked my girlfriend for uh, some uh, a little bit of help. Can you give me an example that I can use for this presentation? And she did. The translation is that she wants to be able to save notes that she needs to remember. She has a long commute and uh, she uh, does some administration uh, regarding an orchestra and, uh, and uh, she wants to be able to just write stuff down so she don't forget it. A to-do list. So that's, uh, that's a web application she would want me to write. I haven't written it, more than uh, proof of concept. Uh, a concrete example, again, we saw this earlier, but this is something that we will actually execute now. So this is the content of something called a feature file, and this is executable. We need to do some work to make it executable, but this is executable. If I change a value here, I could break the tests. So we see that uh, we have something that the users want to save notes easily. They should be saved automatically. There shouldn't be any save button or anything stupid like that. The scenario here, Marlin wants to remember to book Erik Eriksson Hallen. When she has entered the details, then should she be able to see the note. That's the requirement. This is enough for me to write a small web application. And this is also enough for me to make sure that I can test it in more than one way. So I can get confidence that it works and I can also get speed uh, to make sure that uh, the internals of the system actually works and I can get that feedback fast. Uh, one way of implementing this could be something like this. And let's zoom in a little bit. Uh, so this is Java code. We notice, or we can notice, that uh, there's a comment here, given Marlin want to remember to book Erik Eriksson Hallen. Uh, that one will be picked up by this regular expression in this case, given there is an annotation given, and some magic here. And all of a sudden, somehow, this method will be executed. Good. When she has entered details, will be ran afterwards, and finally, there's a then step here. So this is the way to translate from Gherkin into Java code. And this is good. This gives me uh, some. Uh, this gives me rather fast feedback. This is something that runs in memory and only in memory. So it gives me fast feedback. It's not too expensive to write. So I could tick off two of the properties that I want. Unfortunately, look, just doing this doesn't give me any confidence that the web application as such actually works. I can't say, tell if it will work or not by this. I can say that uh, it's rather likely that the model will work, the web application, I don't know. Right, so I can do it again. And let's see if we can zoom a little bit again. Pretty much the same thing, but in this particular case, I'm using something called Selenium. Anyone using Selenium? One, two, three, not too many. Okay. Selenium is a tool to remote control a browser. And according to one of the developers, uh, James, is it James Stewart? You shouldn't use it too much. He uh, tweeted about not too long ago that if you're using uh, Selenium, don't use it too much. It's a good tool, but shouldn't be overused because it's rather slow and it, it stuff gets brittle. Uh, what we can see here is that uh, we have uh, some way to uh, find elements. We have some way to type that send keys and uh, type a little bit more, send keys again. Uh, we have a when step, which in the uh, web application doesn't do anything because that's done by JavaScript in the background, so I don't have to 
uh, push, push a button here, and then I can spend some time looking for an element called notes, get the values from it, and verify that it contains the stuff I actually entered just a few minutes ago. So, this gives me confidence. It does definitely not give me speed. This is slow. If we have time, we'll uh, look at, uh, at the demonstration where I run this. Uh, but yeah, it takes like five seconds to do this. It takes less than one second to, do, to run the other one. So that's just five seconds. But if we multiply that with, I don't know, 500 scenarios, 500 times five, I don't even know how much that is. That's hours. It's not okay. So how can we achieve these things? Well, the thing here is that all problems in computer science can be solved by another level of indirection. So what on earth does that mean? My interpretation is that if we introduce an abstraction layer and push the problem somewhere else, it might be easier to solve. And that's one of the things we tend to do as developers. We push the problem around. It was complicated over here. Okay, so let's move it here. Maybe it's easier to solve here. And all of a sudden, with some luck or some, uh, some competence, we will find a better spot for this, this uh, complexity or this problem. So an abstraction layer somewhere and push the problem somewhere else. Um, this is something that is sometimes is referred to as the uh, testing iceberg. A few of you had heard about the testing pyramid. Have you ever heard about this one, the testing iceberg? Yep, one person. Okay, two. So you have read the, the blog post Sebros wrote a long time ago. Um, the thing here is that these examples that I showed you, they may or may not be interesting. Ah, Let's put it this way instead. There are things that uh, our system should do that is interesting for the business. They could and sometimes they should be expressed as ex uh, concrete examples using tools like, uh, like Gherkin. Some stuff is not that interesting for the business, therefore we don't have to discuss it with them, nor do we have to share our examples. So therefore, we're trying, I'm trying to say that uh, running these examples should not always go through the user interface. It's okay to connect somewhere else. It's okay to connect to the model, for example. I tend to do that. I tend to connect not just through the user interface, but definitely to the model in many cases when I use uh, tools like Cucumber, for example. Uh, and in order to be able to support this, I need an architecture that actually is able to allow me to connect wherever I need in a rather easy fashion. Um, Anyone heard about something called the hexagonal architecture? Great, or not so great, because this is something that has been around for a long time and not too many of you have heard about it. It's an idea that uh, Alistair Coburn came up with and I think it was 1994, might be even older. So it's been around for a while. It can be drawn like this. We have an inner circle with our core model objects talking to each other, doing stuff. We have some kind of layer around it. Um, and in this case, we have six different ways of contacting this system. That's why it's called hexagonal. It could be five, could be one, could be something else. But the point here is that we really want to make sure that in the inner circle, our objects have no idea of how they were requested. So if we have a web application, the web stuff should not leak into the model. If it does, you have a problem. So this means that I could connect directly as a browser to, to, uh, to the outer layer, as if I were a user uh, using the web application. I could also connect straight into the model. And if I can do that, if I can do both of that, then I could have all three properties, confidence, speed, and, and uh, fast feedback. No, 
low cost. Thank you. It's also known as portion adapters. Some people are talking about uh, onion architecture. It's pretty much the same thing. So, in the, in the example I'm going to show you, or actually in the uh, previous example where we just connected to the model, I connected to something I call the notes repository. So that's somehow a place where I can store notes. Uh, I can fire up Selenium, which will uh, use Firefox in this case, and I can talk to uh, the controller this way. Or maybe that one should have been drawn a little bit shorter. Anyhow, I can connect using a browser. Another way of looking at it would be we have the model that has a lot of things in it when we can connect to these things. We can draw some kind of circle around it which will shield the model from the horrible outside world. And we can use Selenium to connect from the outside and therefore make sure that we connect to the stuff inside and maybe I don't know where the, that one is headed, maybe the database, maybe somewhere else, I don't know. So by separating things very, very hard, we are able to get a few good properties. Testability is perhaps the most important one. So just uh, repeating the, uh, the feature, Marlin should be able to save stuff. Um, what I want to do now is I have my Gherkin, this example. We have seen one implementation, oh, sorry, we have not seen one, we have seen two implementations of steps that would be able to be executed uh, based on this, um, this scenario. Uh, and what I would like to do now is to introduce this abstraction layer. So I'm going to introduce an helper. A helper that will be able to take a decision. Should I use an, something in memory or should I use a browser? and then test my application instead of having no helper and connecting to the application directly. So this is the abstraction layer I was talking about. Um, so the uh, implementation of the steps looks like this. Now. And as you may be able to see now, there is no connection to the model. There is no connection to the, uh, using Selenium. We don't use Selenium. The only thing we do here is translate Gherkin into Java code and then delegate to helper. That's it. Nothing else. And this is very typical for code, good step code that you, you may or may not write. They are one-liners or two-liners, not more. They are just translators. So we're using the steps here to translate Gherkin into Java. Nothing more. Uh, the helper looks like this, and the interesting part happens here. In its uh, constructor, I'm checking a property. In this case, I'm looking for a property called browser, which we almost not can't, can't see here. Ah, sorry. Uh, there's a property called browser, and if that one is set properly, we will use the browser note helper. Otherwise, we will use the in-memory note helper. So that should be interpreted as if I tell, if I execute this with, the, with an argument, please use a browser, then we will use a slow version. If I don't, we will use a fast version. But we use the same example every time. And that's important, because the example should work even if we just connect to the model or if we connect through the uh, user interface. Um, the in-memory note helper looks like this. This is uh, pretty much the same code you saw earlier. I just moved it. We're creating a new node. We store it somehow, and we check that we can find it. So this is the exact same code you saw previous. I hope so, at least, if I haven't made a mistake. But I think I haven't. I don't think so. Uh, the uh, browser version looks like this. I hope you can read it in the back. Uh, we have lots of more or less ugly Selenium code here. We also need to start the system. 
So in this particular case, I run my main method and make sure that I uh, this one starts default on, on port 4, 5, 6, 7. So I was using, I think I was using Spark Java in this case to do this. And then we have the same code as we saw previous. We uh, use the abstraction of the, the, uh, for the web driver, which I call browser, to find elements and then do stuff such as type and then verify that we saw something. But the important point here is that I'm connecting through different seams, but I use the same example. So I have a helper, and that helper takes a decision. Should I use the model directly, or should I use the application through its user interface instead? And you decide that when you start running the test suite. So running from a command line looks like this. Clean build takes one second because it's Java, so it takes some time to start the uh, stuff, stop stuff. Doing the same thing, ah, sorry, that's rather fast, compared, uh, ah, rather fast. I would prefer to have it some second, but again, it takes time to start stuff. Uh, if I do it like this, it takes five seconds. So it's slow, but I know that the application was able to start, and that's a good thing. I also know that uh, I am able to use the most important use case. That's a good thing. And just by knowing that the application was able to start, that's, that's a big win in some situations. Time for demo. Yes, I have time for demo, because this didn't take that much time as I had ex anticipated. So let's see if I can do this. I said that I would run Gradle, wrapper. Let's do a clean and let's do a build. And had I been smart, I would have done this before. Let's do it again. Yeah, so there's one second. Um, if I want to do it with the browser, I should do it like this. Browser, and it should equal true. So all of a sudden we are starting a browser, doing a lot of stuff. We didn't see the browser, but maybe we can do that if I'm fast. Nope, I wasn't fast enough. Sorry. Uh, oh, we, sp we saved a second. That's great. Uh, still too slow. And I can promise you, we, there is a browser that was started here. And if I put a sleep somewhere in the code, we could be a, even be able to see it. But I don't want to do that. Um, I think it's really important to run stuff from a command line, because that enables me to do this. So I would probably not run all, uh, both of these run it both these ways during my regular development. I would probably just run the in-memory version because I would probably be doing more. Uh, if I did a lot of changes to the model, that is. If I didn't do a lot of changes to the model, or rather the changes to the uh, web application, of course I would run the slower version. But in uh, your continuous integration system, and I really hope you have one, you should be able to run both of them. So running from a command line like this is valuable. Is anyone in here not using continuous integration? Good. I just uh, started working with the team, or I did that uh, this summer. It turned out, no, they had thought about it. Might be a good idea, but no, for some reason. That was one of the first things I, I uh, set up. So the conclusion here is that Test automation without understanding the problem, that's rubbish. BDD is one way of understanding what to test or what to build. Uh, whatever you do, you must support testing at different seams. And if you are really rigid with the separation of concern, so in your controllers, you just do translation and then you call the model. 
then you can have something like this where we can run examples that are business interesting in many different ways, in many different scenes. We need confidence, speed, and we also need low cost. So that's the testing pyramid again. If someone is interested, this example is available on GitHub. And uh, since I'm using uh, Gradle Wrapper, all you should have to install is uh, Java. It might not work on Java 9. I don't have no idea. I haven't tried it there. I'd like to say thank you to a couple of guys that has, has helped me with this presentation. They're also my colleagues in a new startup that we are just starting. Helmer and uh, Henrik, thank you. And I've been talking about testable architecture and the uh, subtitle is understanding what to implement. So thank you very much for listening. I think we might have time for questions and uh, maybe not too many. There's lunch just in a few minutes. But let's uh, see, are there any questions? Yeah, there's one question. So I have one question. Who are we, whom, how many of you are interested in attending the course that Geekon will be running in December in Warsaw? regarding behavior-driven development. And you don't have to answer now. So, any questions? I have a question regarding yeah. the Firefox browser. Why, why do you need to you know, kind of to use it? Um, sorry, my question was about, so you had in memory and in browser, and in memory use just Java classes, but uh, there are some um, um, web drivers which can be used in headless mode. Yes. For, for, for example, PhantomJS or yes. Chrome. That's something. absolutely true. Yeah. But the show is worse if I don't have a browser that pops up. I would have wanted to see the browser. Yeah, but you can gain the speed. Yes, I can. So, but if my uh, if my users are using Firefox, uh, can you not? do uh, cross-browser testing. Sometimes you can't, sometimes you can't. Uh, so this is one way of using the browser. It's also one way of making sure that we can do cross-browser testing. You can run the same examples using Firefox, Chrome, and Internet Explorer, okay. if needed. It's just a matter of varying how you start the system. Thank you. But I think you're absolutely right. Of course, I could run with something else that would be faster. Absolutely. Yes? Uh, in your approach, there are uh, two test implementations to cover one test scenario, mm -hmm. uh, which increases the maintainability cost. Uh, do you believe that it's justified? Sorry, I, uh, I missed something. There is one test scenario. Yes, there's one. With two implementations. Yes. Uh, so the maintainability of the uh, test is doubled. The in a sense. Cost. In a sense. Uh, but if I just run, uh, run. Uh, I mean, I could have two scenarios testing the model. I could have 10 of them. So maybe I could have more examples that would cover the model and not just using the browser. And in that particular case, I could cover more uh, scenarios inside the model and have confidence that the stuff were wired up, up properly. But if I only run it in memory, then I have no idea if the uh, controller are connected properly or not. So I want both. And if I have, say, two more examples, and I run two of them in memory and just one of them through browser, we could start uh, gaining uh, even more. Yes, in, b behind you. Uh, one question. Um, uh, closer, closer. One question. Um, to, to keep the speed or short feedback loop mm -hmm. uh, in case um, there is a database, there is the web server, which yep. is taking time to start up, yep. to manage, to, to set up. Um, are you, in fact, maintaining two kind of tests? One is with all the dependencies, like UI, web server, database, yes. Yes. and then the second one, which, which is cut off those yes. slows. Okay. There's nothing preventing you from having uh, three different setups or ten different setups. One of them could be mock out the database, and one of them could be connect all the way down to the database. So you could definitely run the system under test, uh, and if you can inject um, in 
and if you can d manipulate the uh, the connection to the database somehow, then you can definitely run the system from a browser all the way through the model and then stop at uh, at um, at stub implementation. That would make sure that uh, the uh, web stuff were connected. We don't really care about the, the database at the moment. That's possible. So given the possibility to test in di many different themes and start the system in many different ways. We can create lots of different uh, combinations here. Some of them would run all the way from the, from the uh, user interface down to the database. Some of them would stop just before the database. Okay, thanks. <coughs> okay, I think that's uh, the queue for lunch. Thank you very much for joining.